Now we're going to talk about small constants and how we can fit those into the MIPS instructions we just saw. So small constants, or immediate values, are used all over code. Some estimates up to 50% of code uses these small constants. And I'm sure you've seen examples of that in something like this. If a equals b, c equals 1, otherwise c equals 2. Here we've got two small constants in this code, 1 and 2. So how can we support this in the processor? Well, the most obvious way to support small constants is to put them in memory and load them. And this is okay, but it means every time you want to do one of those constants, you have to go load it from memory. And we talked about before, because the memory is so big, it's also very slow. Another approach we've seen is creating hardwire registers. So we did this with R0. Remember, we wanted the constant 0, so we made register 0 be 0. And you could do this, but there's a question, how many of them do you put in? Because if we're going to have a whole bunch of these, so say we don't just want R0, we want to encode, I don't know, 0, 1, 2, minus 1, 128, all of a sudden we need a lot of bits to choose which one of those registers to use, and it's going to start taking up a lot of space in our instructions. So what MIPS does is something in between. Some of the instructions can have constants inside the instruction, and you've already seen this with the add i instruction and the branch not equal instructions. What happens then is the control logic sends the constant from the instruction to the ALU. So here's the example we saw. We saw add i, and here's it's got this value 4, and this 4 is encoded inside the instruction itself. But there's a problem with this, and the problem is this picture we showed you before. So we only have 32 bits for our instructions, and we already showed you that we we're using all of the space in the instruction for useful things. So where are we going to find the space in the instruction to encode this constant value? And this is an engineering trade-off. This is a question of when the people who designed MIPS sat down to do it, how did they trade off space in the instruction for space for controlling registers and opcodes versus space for having the immediates? So let's take a look at this. And the way MIPS handles it is it has different types of instructions or different formats of instructions for different kinds of things. So MIPS has three instruction formats, and the first one is the R format. And the R format gives us an operation and three registers and no immediates. That's what we just saw on the previous slide. Then you have the I format, or the I, I for immediate instruction, and this makes a trade-off. So it gives us an operation, but instead of having three registers, we now just have two. But instead of having no immediate, we now have a 16-bit immediate. So we've traded off some of our register space for some immediate space. And MIPS has a third type of instruction, which is the J instruction. And the J instruction is just used for jumps, and it has no registers, but it has 26 bits of immediate space. So let's take a look at how this trade-off works. So here's an example of all of our instruction formats. If we look at the first one, the R format here, this is the one we looked at before, and it's for typically arithmetic and logic instructions. You can see here we have 6 bits for the opcode, 5 bits for each of our registers, the shift and the function, just as we had before. And so this gives us our three registers, but no room for an immediate value. If we now look at the I format here, we can see that we get two registers, and now we've taken the rest of this space here, taken 5 bits from this register, 5 bits from the shift amount, and 6 bits from the function, to create an immediate field. And this immediate field is now 16 bits long. So we've traded off one register file, entry, sorry, one register, and then these two pieces of data, the shift amount and the function code, in order to fit in an immediate code here. And this is used for load and store instructions, which have immediate offsets, branch instructions, which tell you where you're going to branch to, and then add immediates and the like, which have an immediate value in it. Finally, the final type of instruction here is a jump instruction. And what a jump instruction does, it trades off all of this information for one really large 26-bit target address. And that's how you can get a long jump instruction. So, here's a question. How large an immediate value can you have for add i? So the immediate bits in add i are interpreted as 2's complement, so what's the range you can have for add i? Well, the answer here is minus 32,768 to 32,767. And the reason for this is we have 16 bits for our immediate field, and a 2's complement 16-bit number goes from minus 2 to the 16th minus 1 to plus 2 to the 16th minus 1 minus 1. So this is the most negative number, 
and this is the most positive number, and that works out from a range from negative 32,768 to positive 32,767. And you can see where these 16 bits come from. They come from 5 bits from taking away this register field, 5 bits from the shift amount, and 6 bits from the function code. So, we talked about how we can put this 16-bit value in there, but how do we use it with the 32-bit register values? So all the values we're using in the MIPS processor are 32-bit values, but now we have this 16-bit immediate. How do we add a 16-bit value to a 32-bit value? And the answer to this is we use sign extension. So we're going to take the 16-bit value and we're going to extend its sign in order to make it into a 32-bit value. And this is quite straightforward. So here we are, we're going to take this 8-bit value and we're going to sign extend it to 16 bits. So the leftmost bit here is 0, and all we do is repeat the 0. So we get 8 more zeros. Now we have a sign extended 16-bit value of that number. We can do the same thing for extending 16 bits to 32 bits. Here's a number, minus 212, which is going to have lots of 1s up here at the front. And when we sign extend it, we get a whole bunch of 1s at the front as well, but it's still minus 212. Now we can use it with other 32-bit numbers. So sign extension is very useful because it preserves the value of two's complement values. So now let's take a quick look at how these immediate values work. So we've seen this before, and now we're going to walk through it now that you know how they're encoded in the instruction. So here's our instruction, add IR6, R0, and 100. Our control is going to tell our ALU to do an add. It's going to tell the register file that it's going to load from register 0. And we're going to take the other value directly from the instruction, 100, but because this is a 16-bit value encoded in our instruction, we're going to have to go and sign extend it to 32 bits. So we sign extend it to 32 bits, do our add, and then we can store the result into our register file.